Welcome to this community conversation, everyone. We're going to um, go ahead and start. I'm sure that we will have some folks uh, continuing to arrive. Um, but we wanted to go ahead and get into it. Um, my name is Margaret Chrome Lukens. I uh, work with the Rural Advancement Foundation International uh, Dash USA, also known as RAFI USA. Um, welcome to How Did We Get Here and What Can I Do? Democracy, Land, and Liberation. Tonight's event is part of our Spirit, Power, and Connection Community Conversation Series. Um, this is a series put on by the Come to the Table program at RAFI USA, which is built on a few core assumptions uh, that we must build strength together in order to have the power to build a more just food system that power is built through relationships and that building relationships and connections with each other is spiritual work. Uh, so our hope for this series is that it will create opportunities for us to learn from and deepen our connections with each other and that it will also help us build connections between issues because we know that all of our work is interconnected. And one of the issues that we felt was important to connect to when talking about just food systems was voting rights and voter suppression. Uh, and Lamicia is going to draw a lot of those connections for us tonight. Um, from RAFI USA's perspective, uh, we advocate for farmers and rural communities. In that work, we see how imbalance in the ownership of the means of production and imbalance in political power and voice has impacted farmers. Um, it's resulted in corporate consolidation, farm consolidation, um, land loss and farm loss, um, divestment from rural communities, um, and those those impacts, land loss in particular, have been even more intense for farmers of color. Um, so we've seen the history and the present um, of the way that black farmers were dispossessed of their land by racist policies and practices, as well as more commonly than some people may realize, just outright violence. We also know the history of black resistance and resilience in the face of those challenges uh, and that black farmers were an integral part of the civil rights movement. Um, and the economic power and political power are very closely related. So grounded in this knowledge, uh, RAFI USA's Farmers of Color Network works with indigenous, black, and other farmers of color by building trust through long-term relationships, facilitating farmer-to-farmer -farmer work exchanges, and providing farmer-led technical support, infrastructure grants, and guidance accessing other resources and programs to better sustain their farms. Um, I also wanted to take a moment to acknowledge um, that while we're focusing on the connections between land and black farmers and the historic struggle, struggle for civil rights, um, what we won't be able to really do full justice to this evening um, is how the story of land in the United States is also a story of colonization, genocide, and land theft from indigenous people. Um, that, is, that is a huge topic that we all need to acknowledge and understand and learn more about, um, but we won't have time tonight. <laughs> um, tonight specifically, we're hoping to situate today's struggle over how we conduct and participate in elections in a historical context. Um, we want you to know that you are a historical actor in the history that we're making in 2020, and we want to make sure you have the resources that you need to take action. We are super grateful to be co-hosting this event tonight um, with Merrill Holloway, uh, who is tonight's moderator and his organization, NC100. They're doing awesome work. Uh, he's gonna tell you a bit about it um, and you should absolutely check them out. Um, so on behalf of RAFI USA, welcome. Uh, we're so glad you're joining us tonight and uh, I'll pass it on over to you, Merrill. All right, thank you so much, Margaret. Good evening, everyone. My name is, uh, like Margaret said, Merrill Holloway. I'm the executive director of NC100 and we are a, a nonprofit. Uh, we're based in Rockingham County, but we have some connections um, statewide. Um, we do, uh, we have, we are connected and working with uh, institutions, um, other small nonprofits, um, people who are committed to equitable distribution of resources and information. Uh, we are organizers at heart. Uh, most of our work is in community organizing, youth development, um, and some economic development. And we believe that uh, community organizing really is an avenue to support educational goals and workforce development, other community services. Uh, we want to uh, be part of a, a new generation of powerful and engaged local leaders. Um, I personally have a uh, background in credit union work for folks that may be uh, familiar with self-help credit union. 
uh, a lot of the work that is foundational and some of the stuff that we we did really was built upon um, looking at investor uh, owned and supported uh, financial institutions that weren't lending money at the rates um, that was satisfactory to people in, in rural communities, black black people, uh, women, other people of color, and kind of you look at uh, where the credit union movement from you know sixty or seventy years ago to now almost you know two trillion dollars in assets and over a hundred million members. So you kind of see how you know galvanizing and pulling people together um, makes a lot of sense and supports powerful um, economic justice goals. And so this aligned with a lot of the work that we do. We do some work with rural forward NC and social determinants of health. Um, and so when we got an opportunity to work with Rafi and, and co-host and moderate this, um, we just jumped at the chance because we're perfectly aligned. So with that being said, I'll, Margaret, if you want to share a little bit of the logistics for tonight and we'll get we'll get rolling. Sure. So we wanted to start by reminding everyone that this session will be recorded. We want folks who can't make it tonight to be able to uh, still see it. Um, the small group breakouts that we're going to do will not be recorded, um, but the private ch Private chats during recorded sessions do get sent in a transcript. So FYI, <laughs> they're not uh, as private as you might think. Um, if you forget to turn your mic off and there's background noise, we'll mute you. It's nothing personal. <laughs> um, in terms of kind of a general roadmap for the evening, um, we are going to start with a few introductions uh, via chat just to get a sense of who's in the room. Um, each presenter will present and those presentations will be followed um, by small group reflections just so that we can process that information a little bit as well as meet each other. Um, those three presentations and small group sessions will then be followed by um, some Q&A with all of the speakers and we will have um, some time at the end um, to share some resources um, about these topics. Um, and we have a document ready to send you with those resources and we'll also collect them as we go through the event um, and send that out to you. Um, I think that is everything <laughs> on my list. Um, it is. Great. Yep. So folks can start sharing those things. Um, your, your, your name, uh, pronouns you may use, um, organization, how are you doing, just a, just a general little check-in. Unfortunately, we don't have the opportunity to be able to uh, be in a in a place where we can shake hands and talk and do all those things but get a good sense of who's in the room for a couple of minutes here folks want to share we can just put those things in the chat put them in the chat okay all right. yeah it's really interesting to see where people are from where are people jumping on the call tonight where are you guys from and what may have brought you here. So you have Mike Hansen here from Coleridge, North Carolina, regenerative farmer, Penny Hooper. Hi, Beth, the Red Rafi, Lauren Greenspan. Hi, Lauren. Lauren and I work together doing some cooperative work in DC. Nice to see you. Sandra Rodriguez with Student Action with Farm Workers. Very nice. All right, thank you, PJ. In Raleigh via Newburn. All right, hi, Edna <laughs> and Scott. How are you guys doing? All right, so we got a little bit of a sense who's in the room. So um, I'll to Jared here. And so yeah, folks, please make use of the chats. I mean, there are opportunities, um, like Margaret said, we will be in small group discussions that people get a chance to interact and talk a little bit and share. Um, but if there's anything that you wanna share, um, feel free to share in the chat. All right, Randolph, Keaton, Men and Women United Farm and Councilman. All right, nice to see you. April. All right, very cool. Uh, well, I guess we can go ahead and get started, I guess. Does everybody want to go ahead and get started? We can go ahead and jump on in. So 
Well, I will do is I will direct you. So we will introduce each one of our speakers. And we're very happy to have our speakers here tonight. Um, and I there's there's so many amazing things that all of the folks that are part of these organizations and good work that have been doing. So there's no way I could do a proper uh, introduction, any real justice. But I will try to say a couple things about the, the folks just so you got get a little bit of where they're coming from. So our first speaker tonight. Um, is Lamicia Winnington, and she is a uh, Deputy Director of Advanced North Carolina. And for folks who don't know what that work is, it is uh, supporting and building political and economic power in Black communities and institutions in North Carolina. Um, in the blog post that we'll give you guys access to, Lamicia talks about having a personal mission to be an advocate for agriculture, climate justice, economic justice, rural communities, and communities of color. Um, and I think I saw that you are uh, an avenging angel from Meredith from back in the day. So throw that little tidbit in there, but please uh, take a look at the blog post that we have and we'll provide that for you. And we will let Lamicia take it away. Thank you so much, Merrill. And yes, I am a proud avenging angel, Meredith College. Um, so yes, good evening or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Merrill stated, my name is Lamicia. A lot of folks call me LA in the community, so either is fine. Um, I, as I appreciate um, Margaret's elevation in words and would like to uh, also elevate a land acknowledgement before I go into my presentation today. And just a land acknowledgement of, of course, the indigenous folks who are the original stewards um, of this very soil and I think about this state and as being a black indigenous woman I understand that duality and we can't really get into the deep historical accord as Margaret already elevated of what exactly that theft looks like and, and just like the permeating uh, impacts on community but you will see traces within my presentation today uh, because I have also incorporated some of my own family history uh, so you will see elements uh, as we discuss black land and economic prosperity and so I'm just setting the groundwork uh, today to talk about the many intersections of when we talk about land and how it's tied to political justice, economic justice, and even resiliency, right? And, and what does that look like for the future? And really am honored to be uh, on the panel today and alongside amazing legends across the state. Uh, just always honored to be in fellowship, but thank you to um, Rafi as well for the invitation. And so I'll share my screen and please let me know if you can't see it and uh, I will continue on no one says anything. Okay, great. So black land and economic prosperity, identifying the web. And so I call it the web. Um, just uh, you'll see here in a moment, uh, uh, just a, a simple graphic, but we hear intersection a lot, but sometimes in my education curriculum and community organizing, we tend to draw and do actual hands on practices to see how we can visually see uh, the intersection and break that down a little bit more. So the web of economic entanglement, and I am going from the economic uh, angle of that because we talk about land prosperity, we talk about food security. We discuss even uh, folks, uh, our communities, where do we go in times of displacement due to natural disasters. Uh, all that takes uh, a certain amount of economic stability, right? And so that liberation is tied into the land. And so what are the webs of economic oppression, okay? And if we can identify the roots of oppression, we can begin to pull those roots and replace them with new revitalized life uh, that will give a new to what we need for thriving communities. And so we see black land, uh, black education, black dollars, we call it, and black youth. And then of course us is everyone, our allies, our people, uh, the, the community that makes up our fight to fight these oppressive structures that have dismantled uh, the black community's ability to thrive on land, land ownership, education, dollar, and our youth development and so forth. So please say a pre-slavery and pre-emancipation. So the reason I say that again, um, as being a, a, a woman of color, but more specifically, I'm a black woman, um, but as an indigenous woman, Many of my community came here prior to the transatlantic slave trade. Um, oftentimes in history books, we don't talk about uh, really in, uh, uh, blatant terms. What does this mean for black communities who were here, autonomous, sovereign, and a part of the original nations? And so there was land ownership. That's why I ground that here. There was land ownership prior to chattel slavery. 
by black individuals. We saw this trend continue, of course, into colonial law, into slavery. Uh, and so here, I just like to ground with photos because oftentimes, unfortunately, like in media, our children, our youth see depictions of landowners as not being people of color. Uh, and oftentimes we see in mainstream media that our relatives, our ancestors, uh, oftentimes uh, it's this depiction that we were just started, our history started slavery. It didn't. Okay, we were, of course, free people before. And so this is just a depiction of free persons of color um, and landowners, specifically in Louisiana. This right here is actually my ancestors. Uh, these are my six great grandparents. Uh, and the land beside them is the land in which they are from. And that is called the Kingdom of the Happy Land. Yes, the Kingdom of the Happy Land. I had someone tell me that it reminded them of something on Disney. So I, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad that it evoked that. Um, and so these were my uh, ancestors, the Carsons, Lucy and Harvey. And so coming from a, a generation of folks who own land, again, I like to ground the first images of a freed people, of a people who were enslaved, not slaves. So we can think about land and liberation in a very different way as we are reimagining re where we go from here. So post-emancipation, the Reconstruction era. So when we're talking about liberation tied to the land, right, we saw that in our, of course, historical court, our, in some of our history books, if we read that upon emancipation during the Reconstruction era, when those seven years were strong prior to the Jim Crow laws being established, that we also saw strong political power and the development of Black towns and Black cities. Well, it requires land to create Black towns. It requires land to create Black cities. So you see the direct link between Black political power, these representatives who were then elected at high numbers, and just think about how miraculous this is um, of, of a feat to do this not only 10 years, not only 20 years out from the emancipation of slavery, right? And this was before the civil rights movement in the history, right, in the 60s. We had two civil rights acts in the 1800s that we don't oftentimes talk about, but it was directly tied to the land. So speaking of these towns, this is just here highlighted when, um, and, and, and Margaret uh, and Rafi will have uh, some of our slides following this so that it, these are hyperlinks so you can see some of this imagery. Um, these were black towns and economic success stories. Uh, black towns that were autonomous were established in 24 plus states. That is incredible just to think about the autonomy that land gave as an opportunity to develop hospitals, churches, uh, when we talk about uh, even, uh, you know, private planes were owned in Oklahoma, and I'll talk more about that later, we're talking about the prosperity tied to the land, the ability to thrive. Of course, North Carolina is my home, so I love to talk about North Carolina. Uh, across the state, we had Black towns. We didn't just have one Black Wall Street, and, and I like to say Black Wall Street is a title because oftentimes we see Durham, but many folks don't know about Sycamore Baptist in Greenville, North Carolina, Pitt County. There were Wall Streets across North Carolina. They were economic hubs, even in the Great Depression era when other communities were going through the Depression, many took loans from Black banks. That happened in Oklahoma, that happened in the Wall Streets of North Carolina. We had an economic model. Black B beaches in Wilmington, Atlantic Beach was a black owned beach. And then we saw, of course, where I'm from was a literal kingdom. It was called the kingdom of the happy land and it had two kings and one queen. And we'd love to talk about that offline. It's an interesting story, I won't go into it. But we had this model of here's a state where we had autonomy and a hierarchy that complemented the land ownership, right? And so these are just some towns and cities uh, that are identified uh, that some are still in existence, some are still black towns, and some, unfortunately, due to, uh, again, uh, we call it land theft, uh, practices where uh, towns couldn't get loans, other uh, models of suppression and oppression, now some of these towns, including the kingdom, um, are defunct. So black land and the black dollar equals black generational wealth. The reason we call it black dollar, let's break that down a little bit. Obviously, you know, it's, it's self-explanatory, but there's actually an annual practice of the community investing in black entrepreneurship and small businesses to say that we need to give a focus to make sure that we are supporting black economic growth and how do we do that? So that's why it's titled that. In North Carolina, again, let's look at, we looked at like the macro, right? of black towns and black cities, but let's look at micro for a moment. An example, Raleigh, North Carolina, upon emancipation had some of the largest settlements in Raleigh, right? In Wake County, 
Oberlin Village was one. Oberlin Village had established amazing churches that are still in existence today, by the way, and still have parishioners. They had uh, everything from farming. It was a major farming agriculture hub, and they were able to establish businesses and became Black middle class thriving towns. Okay, it was amazing. It's called Oberlin, a village rooted in freedom. Wilmington, as many are familiar, I think more and more, uh, Wilmington was an example of fusion politics, right? Elected officials and professionals were there, three of the city aldermen. And I love these facts because it really grounds what was happening on the land. Uh, members served on the Board of Audit and Finance. You had Justice of the Peace, Deputy Clerk of Court, Street Superintendent, political power. Coroners, policemen, mail clerks, mail carriers. You're seeing this intertwining because it's tied to the land and of course economic development and that revolving cycle of funding and money in the community created these jobs and these opportunities. We also saw families were skilled craftsmen, right? And service professionals, bakers, grocers, mechanics, painters, watchmakers, incredible. Right, and just think about all of the, the multiple jobs housed in one city. And it was an example of fusion politics for people's campaign movement and the current iteration you hear that term fusion i think more readily today but in wilmington they were doing it already they had black and white citizens together in office and thriving in this community oh and finally they also had restaurants and shoemakers and the like coming back to wake county I actually lived in this community. My entire family lived in this community when I came to school for close to 10 years. And it's funny because we didn't realize where we moved. It just felt like home. And then I realized why, because anywhere where there's land in history, I usually find myself there uh, by destiny. So this is Method Road. This is one of the only nationally registered historic African-American landmarks in Raleigh. And even during the I-40 expansion that impacted Meredith, because I was there at the time, and NC State, it didn't impact this community today because they were protected as a national historic landmark. There's still a church there that they still attend every Sunday. City of Raleigh uses the same buildings. Even this classroom here, my brother and I have taught music in this very classroom as recent as last year, just the history. And the graduates from this school, they are still living around the community in historic method. If you go a little bit past historic method, you'll see ES King Village, Wolf Village for NC State and other NC State property. But here's the thing, historically, all of that was historic method, all of it. Even down to the US Postal Service, the, the post office is on the corner near the railroad across from Meredith, that was the first black postmaster ever in the state, okay? Again, it was because of the land. Web of land injustice, and again, theft of black land in 150 years. So we're, we're getting to something a, a bit more somber, right? The reality. During this reconstruction era, as folks were either reclaiming land, like as my people did, because we were here prior and we already had land, but we had to reclaim it because we were now, you know, free people. Uh, and other folks who were purchasing land or through uh, the initial uh, promise of land uh, to folks, 40 acres and a mule, we had thriving communities. But of course, this was met with violence, massacres, coup d'etats, and the like. Um, this is Oklahoma, Wall Street. It is just one example of many towns across the, the United States at the same time that this was happening. Um, Oklahoma, the Black Wall Street there had 21 restaurants, 21 churches, uh, law offices, 30 grocery stores. You talk about food deserts and food insecurities. Well, guess what? How, uh, 30 grocery stores, there's, you're really directly eliminating through that cooperative model food insecurity when you have one area, one town with 30 grocery stores. So we begin to think of this, right? There's land. And then they even had six private planes. Think about that. The turn of the century, 1900s, six private planes uh, in a black only town. Here's where we are. Uh, black Wall Street, as it was known, was the first uh, city to be bombed by its own government in this nation that land and its people was destroyed, terrorized, and displaced. So I know I'm coming up on my time and I want to make sure, I'm gonna flip through here and again, this will be sent to folks so we can ruminate over, but I wanna say those attacks continued. We have gone from 14% of land ownership to 1% of farmlands. 
By the turn of the century, over 600,000 black farmers were removed from their lands. Heirs' property prevented folks from get, receiving loans for their lands to actually renovate their farmlands. Uh, we saw that the attack is created by the systemic discrimination and lending practices, even by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And we know that by 1975, just 45,000 Black-owned farms remain, and it still continues today that Black-owned farms and Black property loss is still at 30,000 acres a year, even to this day. So I'm going to skip forward. A lot of this stuff I've already covered. But I want to stop here because I know I only have two minutes. When we're talking about the next iteration of the future, right? We're talking about black bodies, our wealth, okay? Because our bodies, our lives are tied to the land. It is a liberation that cannot be disjointed. And that's what I'm setting this, the platform here as we are reimagining safety, land ownership, economic models. We know that if we are not supporting this economic wealth through land ownership, and then passing it down through land trust, through actual protected ways to pass it down through families to create generational wealth, we are still implementing practices that will set up families to be denied for mortgages. That many families, black and brown both, are living in hotel complexes and absolutely are not counted in the census, do not have political power, and definitely cannot receive any kind of uh, support around when we're talking about resources and disaster. These are just some examples. So I'll leave you with this. As we envision, folks talk about seven cooperative principles. These are some, many change and are different, right? But it's about autonomy and independence, education, and a model that can create the Wall Streets, the kingdoms that we formerly had. And economic justice means supporting those businesses, colleges, towns, and infrastructures. Self-sustainability practices, folks who are homeschooling now because of broadband divide, virtual learning, we're already in 2020, we're already doing it. How can we support folks to continue doing it healthy and holistically? And then entrepreneurship support. There's three phases, owning a business, own the land and the business, develop land trust or similar protection, and rent to other black business owners. And finally, my last slide, uh, we see this, this future closer than ever. Present day in Georgia, recently 20 black families purchased 100 acres of land for safety and economic reset. And so how can we continue to imagine this kind of opportunity to thrive, but also be healthy? Even when we're talking about environmental devastations, dirty corporations, we know that over 60% of black and brown folks live only two miles away from a toxic waste zone. So even when we're talking about reimagining safety, it's also the body because the land and our liberation is one. Thank you. Thank you, Lamisha. I think that's, that's very powerful. I, I, I love um, kind of the framing of have a historical context before you have these conversations and the, the telling of a story um, that there's just no, that this is recreation of things that have already been there. And there's not just some magical place that existed somewhere, you know, that just everything happened in the right, uh, right mix for it just to happen just, just out of the thin air. Um, there, there, there's a lot of stuff that goes in behind it. So I appreciate that. Um, we are going to allow everyone to be able to have 10 minutes of reflection. Um, we'll, and we're going to put people in small groups um, to kind of like talk a little bit and think about like, where are you feeling and um, in reaction to, to some of the information that Lamisha just shared with us. Um, and our, we are doing that in a, we have those groups already set up. Okay, and there in each group, um, we were randomly just putting people in rooms. There will be a facilitator there um, that will be able to, they'll be part of the conversation to kind of help move it uh, forward. So each room will have uh, one of our wonderful speakers or another staff member from Rafi. Um, and I think I'll be in one of those rooms too. So if we're ready to do that, um, thank you so much, Lamisha. And I know we'll be talking to you a little bit later. All right, those are really great conversations and we are going to try to move and groove. We'll have opportunity for people to ask questions a little bit later. Um, but again, for folks, uh, so just so you don't lose where you were uh, and what you were thinking, feel free to have questions in the chat. Um, you can put questions uh, privately to, to myself or Jared or Margaret if there's stuff that you would like us to be able to ask. We're going to be able to ask questions. Um, we have about 15 minutes or so or 10 minutes set aside for with the speakers, Margaret. Okay. All right, so to keep us on schedule, because that's what I'm supposed to be doing. So hopefully we can stay on schedule here. Um, our next speaker, and again, I will direct you guys to the 
wonderful blog post that uh, that was that Rafi has put together uh, that details the the folks that have joined us today. But uh, the next voice that you will hear will be um, will be Courtney, and uh, I can share a couple things about him that I just pulled out. Um, if I can find that, I had that in front of me, and now I don't have it in front of me. Here we go. All right. So uh, first thing I'd like to share about Courtney, and very um, very happy to have him here. Uh, he's with uh, with a lot of has a lot of different things that he's done over his career. I've just recently found out he's got some connections to my hometown. Um, but he's with Blueprint NC. For folks who do not know a little bit about Blueprint NC, it is uh, a network of nonprofits, nonpartisan organizations working across uh, together with uh, for issues against uh, over racial lines to advance equity and social justice in North Carolina. Uh, Courtney is a, a native of Kinston. Um, he is a North uh, a North Carolina A&T Aggie. Um, and I'm sure he's very proud to, to talk about um, and uh, officer with the NAACP um, and is in, in the voting space. And we're talking a little bit about how this connects to elections and voting rights um, serves on the Lenore County Board of Elections. Um, so, Courtney, we will allow you and have you join us. Come off mic and share with us um, your wonderful presentation. Take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Meryl, and, and I appreciate that introduction. Uh, Margaret, uh, for uh, uh, actually uh, my uh, uh, being here and getting to know you and about Rafa USA has been quite rewarding. And uh, so I'm just kind of proud to serve, uh, uh, share this space with you today. I uh, wanted to, uh, there are a couple of things I'm going to talk about. The first one is going to be talking about developing the Farmers Cooperative right up near uh, Merrill up there on the other side of in Halifax County, Virginia, a place called South Boston, Virginia. And, uh, and of course, uh, I guess I'll try to answer three questions there. One would be, why did we do this? Why did we organize the cooperative? Uh, the second one would be, what were some of the challenges to de develop it? And what are some of the things that we celebrated? And uh, so we actually, during uh, the 60s, uh, actually uh, in 1968, uh, one of the things, uh, I'm sorry, 1965, after his reelection, Lyndon Johnson decided that one of the most important things we could do in this country was to have a war on poverty. And that developed an Office of Economic Opportunity, OEO. And uh, from that, uh, there were a lot of things funded. Uh, several projects, but among them were some farm cooperative pro projects. And there was a, a community action agency there in South Boston that decided that they would pursue that, being as rural as uh, Halifax County is about 900 square miles, uh, a lot of farming. And at that time, <clears throat> there were a lot of sharecroppers, uh, many, most of who were black. There were, of course, quite a few white uh, sharecroppers there. And then also there were quite a few African-American landowners uh, in South, uh, South Boston. And so all of this, uh, one of the struggles that they had, one was um, basically, you know, there wasn't a lot of income from tobacco in a sense by the time you got a lot of money, but then by the time you paid for people to harvest it, by this time families that had gotten smaller. Uh, it used to be, it was pretty profitable when you had eight, nine, children and the family, and they provided the sweat equity for, uh, for the family. But this was, uh, had gotten into the 60s and things, families have gotten relatively smaller. Uh, most children, uh, when they left home, because of the struggles on the farm, decided that they would go north. They would actually take jobs in Washington, D.C., Boston, Massachusetts, New York, places of that nature. So it left the family farm uh, sort of a little bit struggling. I had to pay a lot of money uh, in order to harvest crops and what have you. So one of the answers would have been uh, a farmer's cooperative. And so one of the th things that it would do is would allow people to, uh, farmers, to pull resources and uh, also share in, in earnings. And so that was the, uh, that was why uh, we decided, you know, that uh, not we, but the people who were running the cap agency decided this may be a way to go to serve that community economically. <clears throat> well, some of the challenges. One was, uh, I uh, basically heard, <coughs> excuse me, 
uh, I think it was Scott mentioned a few minutes ago uh, when we went uh, about the lack of services for farm service agencies. And that was a big challenge. A uh, big challenge was in the 39 year, I believe it's 39 years, 30 plus years of, of the history of Farmers Home Administration, not a single black farmer had ever acquired in 1969, a loan from Farmers Home of any kind, no farm loan, no housing loans, uh, anything. And, uh, and one of the uh, first things that happened when we started this uh, uh, Farmers uh, Cooperative was to have this big meeting. And this big meeting was open to everybody, all of the farmers, black, white, whoever. Well, the wealthy farmers saw this as a big threat to their operation. First thing happened was that when we got there, the only uh, person from a farm service agency was the extension officer, who was at that time the black uh, African-American extension agent. Uh, the white uh, farm service uh, extension agency didn't bother to come. Somebody came down from USDA from Washington, walked in, recognized that there were no farm service agencies there, apparently made a call by lunch. We had all these people coming from all everywhere. Folk had never seen farmers, these were farmers, had never seen any of these people before. Uh, and that, therefore they weren't getting the help that they should have been getting. So that was one thing that happened. And when that was a challenge because they were not, they did not know about the farm programs that the federal government offered to them. Another one was, uh, uh, the talk around the place was the recent Ku Klux Klan rally at the, uh, at the National Guard Armory in South Boston. That was another one. So you can imagine the presence of racism uh, and, and what have you that was there. And then there was the, this thing, this farmers cooperative served as a threat to landowners uh, who had sharecroppers because what had happened was they were paying, they were providing supplies to their uh, sharecroppers. In other words, fertilizer and also loans uh, and, and these kinds of things. So, you know, by the co-op coming in, the co-op would actually alert farmers that there were other sources of getting money. There were other cheaper sources for, for buying fertilizer. So just uh, moving along there so we don't take up too much time with this, but these were some of the issues that we had. So <clears throat> what happened was we went, uh, the, uh, the other challenge, big challenge that we had was farmers. There was a culture there that you could only make money. You could only, you were only farming when you were raising tobacco and grain. Uh, there was no other crops, veg, uh, uh, anything. So even after doing a feasibility study and it being proven that that part of Virginia had some of the best land uh, in the nation for r r growing vegetable crops and what have you, it took some persuading to get farmers to even just try uh, uh, these crops. And that was, uh, that was the other big obstacle that we had in terms of, uh, of this uh, uh, challenge that we had in terms of developing the farmer co-op. And the final thing was that there was some co-op back in the 20s that went broke and took a lot of farmers with it. So they were just scared away from them. So we moved on in and basically some of the things that I've tried to get through is that we were able to celebrate as a result was one, we were able to get farmers uh, farm services. Mainly one of the biggest ones was Farmers Home Administration. And they were able to start getting loans uh, at lower interest rates. Uh, and they didn't buy for either from landowners or from some local bank that was just set up to, it was almost like loan shops. And then from that, we uh, kind of moved on into uh, try, uh, crops and, the biggest thing was trying to get farmers to raise cucumbers without a contract. In other words, we knew that there was better money on the fresh market and the farmers were accustomed to those who had dealt with cucumbers. They sold them to a pickling company and the pickling company gave them a contract before they put them in the ground. So actually I had to go to, uh, I think it was North of Chesapeake, Virginia one, to get a contract from Coins Products Best, Best Foods uh, for about 10,000 bushels of cucumbers. And uh, 
So, but knowing at the time that we could get more money, and that was at two dollars a bushel. Uh, I like that we actually sold most of those cucumbers. We didn't quite meet our obligation to the contract, but we sold most of them for about from five to seven dollars a bushel on the fresh market. Uh, so that was the difference in the prices. Uh, farmers did get a chance to realize a profit from these cucumbers, but that was the only crop that we did. Uh, in addition to that, uh, and these are things that we celebrated. We celebrated the fact that uh, when we built a, a headquarters sort of, which we had a grading station and waxing station for the cucumbers, uh, we were able to get a waxer from somewhere down in uh, Florida, a uh, person that was doing the piece of the Dutch study just happened to run across it. We got that at, at a big savings. And then we built the building. But we, we bought the supplies for the building and the members of the co-op built the building using their sweat equity. And we hired a construction supervisor. That actually went into something else with housing. Uh, again, I told you that they had not, there were people were living in pretty bad looking houses there and, you know, struggling for houses. So with the connection that we get, had with Farmers Home Administration at this point, we were able to help them to secure Farmers Home Administration loans. So we started this self-help housing project, whereas people were actually building five houses, five families would get the other build five families, five houses. And Farmers Home Administration uh, funded a, um, construction supervisor, the same person that supervised the, the building. And so they would build the houses step by step so everybody could move in at the same time. Uh, the other thing we celebrated was uh, a bunch of clothing things. And But the biggest uh, big thing was that having this relationship built with federal agencies and farm service, uh, I mean, farmers and farm service agencies uh, from the federal government. Uh, so. Uh, if there are questions later on about cooperatives, I will uh, try to answer those. I did not want to get uh, to uh, use up most of my time for that. And uh, so the next part that uh, my, what I'm presenting today is civil rights, uh, 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 civil rights and voting rights, and during uh, the civil rights era. And, uh, but I'm gonna start somewhere that LA kind of uh, did a lot on uh, in her piece and to talk about this transition from a fusion uh, government and, and, uh, and, and the benefits of, the, uh, of folk fusing, fusion, fusing together. I'm gonna use a couple of uh, political parties, I, but I tend to make sure that you understand that this is all nonpartisan. Uh, but I'll name some parties and what they were doing at that time. So basically, uh, at that time, the Liberal Party, was, uh, the left party, was the Republican Party, uh, basically. And what happened was, in the late uh, 1890s, um, they had, uh, bank, well, about mid-1890s, they fused together with um, a group called the Poplars, which were actually a group that developed out of the Farmers Alliance, and they were made up of poor white farmers for, for the most part. And what they did was, at that time, the Democrats, who were uh, the people who actually uh, were, were very difficult at that time, I just say, uh, they ran the government. Uh, they, they, they had all the political offices and everything. So that with this fusion politics, uh, they actually began to take over uh, the political power in North Carolina state government. I heard somebody mention about Rocky Mound and some other places that things were going on as well. And uh, they began to take over that power. And so it became a threat to this Democratic, uh, uh, the Democratic Party at the time. So what happened was they went in and nullified in 1898, November 10th, 1898, they went in and nullified the, the um, actual, they nullified the actual uh, election up there that year. They, the ballots weren't white enough, I think was one of the reasons for nullifying it. And they uh, disqualified the voters and they took over, actually went over and took over uh, a city of duly elected officers and 
Now, I've heard there were two, 300 people that got killed. Well, people who, who are linked to the descendants talk that, say that the Cape Fear River ran red with blood uh, of, of Black people and fusion people in the Wilmington. Uh, there were Black press there. There was a shipping yard and Wilmington was basically on its way to becoming what Atlanta is today. And, uh, and so they went in and they just took over the government. Then after that, they went back to Raleigh and they passed all of these, and this is how it gets into what I'm talking about, uh, these uh, uh, crazy voting laws, these Jim Crow voting laws that we hear, heard so much about, uh, laws that required paying a poll tax. Uh, having a literacy test, literacy tests that involve folk having to tell how many bubbles in a bar of Ivy soap or how many uh, beans in a jar, and then even sometime having uh, tests that uh, were uh, where the register couldn't even answer. But you had to do these things to register to vote, unless your father or your I'm sorry, your grandfather voted before 1865, and therefore you were grandfather. Uh, that's that's how that worked, and so so what happened was as a result of that uh, we uh, <clears throat> we came up with uh, really you know um, enough voter suppression there that it caused not another African American we had African Americans in the U.S. Congress and not another Amer African American to get elected to the uh, U.S. Con Congress for over 100 years. And that's, that's what happened as a result of those Jim Crow uh, voting laws and those voting suppression laws. So this happened. And uh, so after, after say, uh, as we moved into the civil rights era, and that's, I guess, most of that time, we'll talk about uh, going back to Emmett Till, I can vaguely remember uh, Jet and Ebony magazines, which were black magazines. Uh, uh, and Till's mother said, don't cover his body, let them see what they did to my boy. And that began to have sort of an effect like uh, uh, George Floyd and, and they called him Perry Jr. Uh, but that, that, that had that same kind of effect on the nation. And the people began to start looking at uh, what was happening. This happened just after 1954, when uh, Thurgood Marshall, who was then general counsel for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, uh, had won the Supreme Court decision, uh, Brown v. the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, which what, what, what that actually did, instead of in, in, say, was saying, separate but equal, but equal was not right, it was wrong. And that was the law that was uh, actually came from a decision of the courts, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson. And so, so at, at, which said that, you know, you could, it was okay to, as long as you separated black folk and white folk and you treated them equal. Uh, and uh, which was never the case anyway during that period of time, uh, you, you would be okay. But what was really important about the, uh, uh, the uh, Brown decision was the fact that it ended segregation. And because of that, you could start beginning assuring that folk were getting the same thing. Well, you know, custom being stronger than law, uh, what happens is that didn't just happen. So it took Rosa Parks sit, refusing to give her, up her seat to a white man. And then they have an over a one year boycott of Montgomery, Alabama busing system uh, before that. And of course, several lawsuits in that whole process uh, ending in the integration of busing where folk could sit anywhere they wanted to on a bus. It took young people actually uh, marching uh, down, you know, and sitting down in, uh, in lunch counters and what have you to uh, bring about integration and public accommodations. And we can kind of go on and on with this, but uh, 
the thing is, is also is something to be said. And, you know, we were part of that generation, that, that, that march that were out there. And, you know, we were sent down and we were told before we went to march the risks that were involved. Uh, one, the risk to our physical health and that, you know, we might get spat on, we might get hit, we might get whatever. And then we were also trained how we did not, re you know, we re respond or react or in a violent way that we, we you know, we kind of took it and we went on. The other thing we were warned about was uh, most of it, we were all, all, just about all college students and what have you trying to get our education, but we'd probably not be able to get a job once we got arrested. And that, uh, because that was arrest, an arrest record. And of course, it was always with black people, or African Americans, folk looking at a reason for not hiring them. And so that was just ideal. You had that arrest record, they could just kick you right out. But, you know, I think most of us saw that the jobs they were trying to kick us out of weren't worth having too much anyway until we got some changes made. So these were the kinds of things that went on through the 60s. Well, you know, the thing was, there were policemen. There were, you know, when we talk about uh, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer and we talk about, you heard the John Lewis story. Who, who beat up John Lewis was State Highway Patrols for Alabama State Highway Patrol. People who beat... Uh, had somebody beat Fannie Lou Hamer was a Mississippi State Police. And we can go on and on. And these people, so what happened was right after the election of J Lyndon Johnson in, uh, in uh, 19, his real, well, his re in 1994, which in 1995, uh, Martin Luther King went to him, Dr. King went to him and said, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mr. President, we're going to need a voting rights law. And so then they got in this exchange about whether we needed a voting rights law, or whether we needed uh, 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 a war on poverty. <clears throat> well, uh, finally, uh, Johnson said to Dr. King that, you know, well, we're going to get this war on poverty started and then we'll come back to that. So, of course, Dr. King goes back to Alabama and they decided to plan this march from uh, Selma to Montgomery. And you pretty much know that story. And, and of course, uh, what happened with that, and of course it took that finally for uh, Lyndon Johnson to say to Congress, we needed a voting rights bill. Significant thing about that was it outlawed all of these the Cronian Jim, Jim Crow laws. Uh, it outlawed those and, you know, people could register and they could vote and, and that was that, that that was pretty much moving real well. Places that had a uh, history of uh, using these discriminatory pra uh, practices to keep people from voting were covered under something called pre clearance. So we did real well until 2013, and there was a case called. Uh, 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 Shelby, Alabama case versus uh, Eric Holder, who was, of course, the attorney general at the time. And that ruling didn't come down to a favor, and it got rid of the pre-clearance component. Now, the law stays in place, but it got rid of the pre-clearance component of that Civil Rights Act. And as a result of that, North Carolina, uh, it being the first on to come out with a voter ID law, a law that was actually uh, uh, basically, as the courts referred to it, as a law that's attacked African American voters with surgical precision. And uh, what happened was, at that, after that, then of course uh, that got struck down. They came back with an amendment, and then you know, and then that is on the court rule, uh, on the court review right now. So these are the kinds of things that has. That, that, that has happened over the years uh, as, it, uh, as we de has de have dealt with uh, voter suppression. And it has hurt, voter suppression has been very costly to the Af African-American community. Yeah. And, uh, and it's even, uh, and now even so, what has happened, the other piece of uh, uh, voter suppression has been gerrymandering. And right now in North Carolina, and this is one of the. Pardon, before, you go, 
Courtney, before you, I just hate to interrupt, before you go into the gerrymander, and I want to lay, leave some time for people to ask some questions. So we'll put a pin in it just for a second. Sure. And we'll think a little bit about the what they've heard and, you know, write down some notes. Because what I'd like to do is like this, that was a wonderful continuation, kind of reflecting on like needing to have the historical uh, background to kind of be able to work forward for to talk about systems. You have to have that context. But let's let's go to we're going to go. If we're going to skip the, the discussion sessions and combine them into a larger one. And that will allow folks to be able to ask you questions that you'll be in that room. And then when we at the end, um, be able to share a little bit about voter suppression and some of those uh, specific things. And then, of course, okay. hopefully people will be able to get in contact with you um, and ask further questions. But uh, what I'd love to do is uh, we want to spend enough, we're going to spend about 15 minutes uh, talking to, uh, to, uh, to, to Pastor Blow. I um, want to, uh, again, refer you back to the blog post. Um, that has more of uh, information about Pastor Blow than I can share. Um, I'd, I'd also li always like to highlight the school piece. And so we got another uh, A&T Aggie um, and also an ECU Pirate uh, with Pastor Blow uh, in, in Snow Hill uh, doing work um, uh, with the, the school system, um, uh, assistant uh, bishop and district elder of Northwest Conference and pastor for a couple of churches in, in the part of the, the state. Um, and his, there is just a long list of community involvement that's expensive. So thank you, Courtney. Pastor Blow, would you uh, jump into your presentation and then that will allow everyone to have a larger conversation uh, where we talk a little bit about the reflections and how those um, things impact us from with the, the, the information we got from Courtney. Yes, sir. And thank you so much. And thank uh, Margaret and all of you that uh, was responsible for allowing me to uh, come. Um, I guess from a pastor's perspective, and we're talking about um, a creating a culture of voting, I'm, I'm certainly reminded of a, uh, a story, and I guess you can't be a preacher without talking something about the Bible, and, uh, but there's a story uh, in the Bible, uh, in fact, that when uh, Jesus was leaving uh, Judea and um, headed towards Galilee, and then you know, all of a sudden he said that I have a need to go through Samaria. And he came to Samaria to this place uh, called Sychar. Uh, and I want to suggest that uh, at Sychar, uh, people are broken and they're wounded and they're hurting and, uh, and, and need to be lifted. And he met uh, this Samaritan woman uh, who had uh, an experience that was very clear to me when I look at that text that um, uh, she was in pain and agony, and he met her at her point of need and got her from where she was and got her to a place uh, that uh, she needed to be. And I, I reference all of that because she became a beacon of light and hope and actually transformed her community uh, as the story would go, but, but without a, um, I, I like to liken it to without a, having a a little battle or confrontation with Jesus, uh, but he was able to make a great impact. And I think that that brings us uh, to the um, uh, to voting and, and how the church has and should continue to play a vital role. One, I think uh, that if we want people to respond and to vote and to turn out uh, from a church perspective, we have to make sure uh, that we create a culture uh, for voting. And uh, in the years past, what has happened uh, many times is we only hear about voting when it was election time. Uh, those elected officials or those that are running for office would in fact stop by the church and they'll leave your offering and kind of beg you to, um, to vote for them. Uh, but what we began to do was Began, and how we began to create that culture, uh, I believe that in, in church family and church work, that if it is important enough uh, to uh, leaders and to parishioners uh, to be dealt with in the community, it is important enough to address uh, during the 11 o'clock hour or your, certainly your main service hour. And so that's what we began to do um, uh, in, our, in our church is to make sure that we were keeping people abreast of current events and things that was happening uh, in the news and, and how people were voting and, and how that would impact us uh, as, a, as a people and as a church family. So we, we started that and, uh, and then we began to hear others 
uh, talking about uh, to their family and friends that this is why we have to vote because they got to know the candidates uh, before election time because at our church and our campuses, we began to create that culture, making them aware of issues uh, that will uh, have an impact um, if we don't vote uh, the, the, the right way or if we don't vote based on people's policy and things like that. And um, so what we, what we did was encouraging uh, members and our parishioners to get involved in the community, uh, get involved on boards, uh, the Board of Election, the DSS board, the library boards, attend your, your, your meetings of your city councils and uh, your school board. Uh, matter of fact, we have a group tonight that is uh, attending the school board meeting. Attend your county commissioner's meeting and begin to see how the people right there in our community, uh, how they are voting, the people that we elected. And so we encourage them uh, to do that and we began to see uh, good results because of the work that began to take place um, on, on Sunday morning um, and, and talking about the uh, current events and, and certainly trying to uh, encourage people to, uh, to vote. So we, we kind of say, look, don't just show up uh, during election time, but we need to hear from my elected officials all year long, whether you're Democrat, or you're Republican, or you're independent, if you're representing us, we need to hear from you um, uh, throughout the year. And so what we, um, what we did and what we began to challenge our membership was that you had to vote. Um, when we wanted 100% of our membership to vote, and guess what, we will call them. Um, when we look at the voting record and you hadn't been to vote, we will call you and ask you, why you're not voting. And we encourage folks to do uh, early voting. Uh, this year, uh, we um, looked at some other um, approaches uh, that we should continue one uh, to vote as we have in the past, but also uh, looking deeper to uh, encourage people uh, that um, have family members and, and friends that if you have not voted in the last uh, couple of elections, then it becomes our responsibility to make sure that we get these people to vote by mail, um, request an absentee ballot, uh, go ahead and once the, um, you get the ballot, fill it out, uh, return it or get a, a immediate family member uh, to return that ballot or give them a stamp and let them uh, send that. We also uh, send it in the mail. We also um, ask every member because we've said in the past that we have enough people that is registered to vote um, that if they would just vote, they would change um, uh, the outcome of any election. And uh, so we saw that it, that was not working. So what we also added this year was to say, let's go out and get 10 new people. Every uh, parishioner, you got to um, get 10 new people registered to vote, and then you have to follow them through to the voting poll and make sure that they vote, and you have to call them um, and, and encourage them uh, to make sure that they're there. And also, we, um, we, we talked about um, <clears throat> um, phone banking and how important that is. So we have, we have targeted uh, each week to try to reach 300 people um, to do phone banking. And, and what that in fact will look like, um, it will, we will, because we normally would gather at the church or at a place in the community and we will make calls from there. But given COVID-19, uh, we are gonna jump on uh, Zoom calls about 15 minutes before our actually start time and kind of, um, you know, just uh, gather as we would and spend an, spend an hour to an hour and 15 minutes uh, calling. Um, and then after that, we would jump back on and talk about um, that experience. So we were, uh, we we're excited about that because we certainly have, have buy-in. And um, one of our um, uh, leaders said that they would actually go through their telephone and, and all of the contacts, and that was a good place for them to start and begin to uh, make, it, make, make sure that all of the contacts that they have uh, in their cell phone are gonna vote and, and track them that way, and that would keep them in uh, communication 
with them. So I, I think ultimately the result is uh, going to be that we're going to have great turnout and, uh, and we're taking it actually to the next level uh, to impact our community and, and to impact voter turnout uh, for, uh, for the causes that, that's at hand. So, um, and just like in getting back to the story that I shared uh, in the beginning uh, with the uh, woman at the well and Jesus having a need to go through sidecar, um, after uh, she was given enough information, uh, it transformed her life. And uh, she left that spot, that well, where she was broken and where she had been wounded and damaged by life. And I suggest it being called kicked to the sidelines of life. Uh, but somehow she was put back together again and left that spot um, where she went feeling lonely and went back into town and began to make a great impact and encouraging them to come and see the experience that she just had. And so we, we're, we're, we believe that this is the same work that we're called to do. One, uh, when Jesus left Judea, headed to Galilee, he said he had a need to go out of his way. So if we're gonna do this work in, in church and in ministry, we have to go out of our way uh, beyond the walls uh, of the church and making sure that we impact uh, the community in a, in a very positive way. And so we also understand, uh, at least for the community that I live in, uh, which is Green County and Snow Hill, um, that many of the pastors here of our approximately 40 uh, African-American churches, uh, many of the pastors uh, do not live in this community. Uh, if anybody that knows anything about Green County, they call it a bedroom community because many people live here, but yet they have to go outside to work, to go to the malls and things like that. Um, so uh, many of the pastors, um, uh, they come to serve their parishioners or churches that they've been um, selected or elected to serve and uh, then they go back to their places. So part of my responsibility, I believe, as well in our church is to also keep those pastors abreast of um, what is going on in our community. And we do that through conference call and meeting with them periodically and also uh, inviting our elected officials uh, to be on conference call uh, with, the, with pastors in our community. And I think it creates a unifying effort to kind of push us forward and move us in, in the right direction uh, in helping to create, uh, not just in, in my local uh, assembly, but throughout our county, a culture of voting and uh, getting excited about the work that uh, we're called to do. So uh, we all will meet people at Sycar because people are hurting. They're hurting for the various reasons, uh, uh, like uh, not having Medicaid expansion, hurting for the various reasons like voter uh, suppression that was alluded to earlier. Uh, most recently, um, our board of election um, was having a big debate about where to have early voting. And uh, one of the board members raised the issue uh, that our election office is too small and given COVID-19 that it would not be safe. So we have two places to vote. Um, the, which is the Board of Election and one of the community centers and someone wanted to raise an issue about um, that it was not safe in that particular place uh, where uh, they were gonna have the, um, uh, the early voting site. Uh, but then when we look at it and we start uh, mapping it out, that place uh, where an incident occurred is closer to the schools, but they never raised the issue about it being um, the, the, the lives of young people in the school every day or a county complex is closer to where the voting site was in which this documented never had a violent incident uh, to our knowledge. And uh, so we have to uh, kind of look forward and, and see what it is that we wanna do and how we can move forward and keep working uh, together to unify. But as a result of that, having someone on that board 
uh, who also helped create the culture of voting in our community uh, was one of the reasons now we are having that voting site for the safety of our community. So uh, I, I think the work continues, not just at election time, but uh, moreover that it is done uh, throughout the year and every single day of the year. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Blow. Um, I think a lot about that, about how to be involved, how to stay involved, how to bring different folks into conversation. So thank you very much. Um, we, we did want to have some time for folks to be able to go back into small discussion groups and uh, think a little bit about what you've heard, how that applies to you personally or your constituency. So if, um, if Jerry, you want to throw us in, in groups and we'll try to, we'll, we had 10 minutes scheduled, um, but we'd love to be able to have as much time for people to be able to ask questions either off mic or through chat. So we will we'll try to stay in, in that eight to 10 minute range, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll defer to uh, the Rafi team on how long we stay in discussion groups. But we are back. So I hope everybody had uh, really great conversations like we did. Um, I really love having the, the time to be in these small, small groups. Um, we should have, um, we are and we are at 730. I believe we, we said we wanted to get you guys out of here on time. Um, uh, Lamicia will be back with us um, soon. But we do have opportunity now for folks to that didn't get it, that didn't have a chance to uh, either have Courtney in your room, um, that did, or you didn't have a chance to have Pastor Blow in your room to have uh, questions um, for our speakers. Um, if there are uh, particular things that um, struck you from Lamicia's um, uh, presentation, still feel free to ask those questions too. Um, and we'll be able to kind of like log those. And when she gets back in here, she has a she had an, another speaking engagement. She should be back soon. Um, but right now, while we have um, Pastor Blow and uh, and um, Mr. Patterson here, let's let's take a, a couple minutes to ask some questions. So we can either come off mic or we can do in the chat. So we have a, we have one already. All right. So Margaret wants to she wants to hear more about um, Courtney, your current work on fair elections. Um, some of the current strategies you're seeing beyond voter ID and um, that that made it harder for people to vote. And I think you talked a little bit before when we had to um, take a break, um, you were talking about voter suppression and gerrymandering in particular, but that's the question that Margaret would love for you to, um, to answer for the group. Oh, still got you on mute here. So, uh... <clears throat> Margaret, what we're doing right now, and, and is uh, a lot of work is centered around voter protection, and that is protecting the vote, but also because of the uprising of groups like uh, uh, Oath, the Oath, Oath, uh, Oath, what is it, the Oath Protectors or the Oath, uh, that there's a group there that actually started out and some 40 years ago, close to 40 years ago, who were suspended by courts saying that they could, there was a moratorium on it. This is where these were off-duty policemen, uh, former policemen, people who were, would go into uh, a polling place and sort of interrogate voters is basically what they were doing. And those tactics were so bad that the courts said they couldn't do it anymore for 40, uh, 40 years. This is the first presidential election uh, that this is allowed again. And I can tell you right now, I've recently through uh, a branch of the NAACP in Columbus County have already gotten some documentation about some activities uh, started by the Sheriff's Department uh, there. So we're doing also protection of voters as well as protecting the vote. And I'd like to say to folk also, uh, my uh, there were uh, on, September the 4th, there were 640,000 absentee ballots mailed out. I did a check today. In my county, there were 2,400 absentee ballots mailed out. So I just wanted to know at this time how many had come back. Uh, 326 have already voted absentee. 326, but 2,400 have already been. Now, let me say this is too much. Uh, and can stand to make too much of a difference 
that if that vote is not protected. I suggest that anybody, anybody would call their board of elections because we all do it differently and find out when they will tabulate at, uh, absentee ballots and how they're gonna do it. And even if they are meeting uh, virtually, how will the public be able to participate in that? That is gonna be an important factor. If you remember the governor's race in 2016 in this state, uh, was won by somewhere between 10 and 12,000 votes. So when you talk about the number of ballots that are being voted by mail, uh, that's going to be a big factor. And it's too much to allow people to just, uh, normally when we count absentee ballots, it's uh, the board in the room and the staff. Nobody's in there, but I'm asking and urging folk to get in that room and find and ask questions when things are not, you know, people are being rejected or what have you. Uh, Margaret, I hope if that if there's something more specific you wanted me to answer, there uh, there are some other pieces out there that hopefully we'll get to. If I get a minute or two, I'll talk about them. And those resources that you put in from Democracy in the NC, uh, one of the big pieces that they will have is and is voter guides, and uh, we can talk a little more about that. Are there other questions that folks have? I, I know in our group, um, uh, Lamisha, I just wanted to make sure that I, I voiced this. I think Mike is still here. I'm not sure, Mike, if you want to come off, Mike, if you're able to get your microphone to work. But two of the things that came from um, from your presentation um, was being struck, you know, about um, the the additional uh, places that were uh, black, uh, other than Black Wall Street in Durham. Um, and then the the topic in question kind of came to like, um, how do you, what's, a, what's an initial strategy to kind of change systems in place um, that eroded these um, already full established um, economies and then how to have young people um, be involved. So those are the two questions that kind of came when, during our small station group. So I'll throw those out there. Thank you. Uh, and just appreciate everyone's flexibility. I actually had to hop off and talk about um, state sanctioned violence, which actually land came up. You never know where land and gentrification will come up. And that'll actually go into part of my answer to the first question. Um, so there, you know, there are so many intricate ways in which land loss has occurred, right? And, and it kind of elevated that, right? So when we're talking about reimagining systems and what needs to be dismantled and then put in place, we also have to talk about the policies, the laws that has allowed for other, and we don't think about land in this sense, right? So when I when I spoke about food insecurity, right? And we talk about uh, some folks, food deserts, that term doesn't resonate with some communities, because uh, like I'm from a rural area and we didn't think of ourselves as being in a food desert. It just, you know, was a, you know, once a month drive out to the grocery store. Um, and so when we talk about reimagining, look at zoning laws, look at competition clauses. The fact that a Walmart is in your area one mile or less from your home and then all of a sudden Walmart super center because of you know thriving community of at least what they want in growth when you have your downtown commissions or whoever is a, a le local elected leader may envision you know more economic growth, more jobs. But then what's left you know not on the table is the fact that if you, allow a competition clause between that uh, individual who's brought that business in, that original Walmart, to sign with the land there, the land, right, the owner that says, okay, if I move, you can't allow anyone to move that is similar to my business within five to 10 years. So that means that community will now be, if they do move to a new center, it's bigger Walmart, just as an example, because that happened in my community. Now a neighborhood is five plus miles away from this new Walmart super center. And we don't think that's how that food desert was created. So there's so many ways to reimagine and re-envision what we have to dismantle, right? And so, you know, when we look at practices, we have to look at zoning, we have to look at the structures in which, and Courtney mentioned this, what are the political structures that we're supporting folks running for office, but creating that connection that being an office holder is direct accountability to the folks who live on that land. And if the person who is holding that office is from that community, they have a unique, you know, 
purview that says these are the issues that has impacted my community and they can speak the cultural language. So you're looking at different angles, political power, uh, food insecurity, gentrification. These are other elements and we were just discussing this. So the step forward is having a diverse team of constituents who holds a specificity from the actual community, right? They're partners, not just participants. They're, you know, you pay them for their time and they're actual partners because they're building a community that will be their community. And diverse constituents, I don't mean that in ethnicity, I mean in specification, specificity, because each community holder also holds a level of expertise. If you're a rural, you know, me, I'm a rural girl, rural woman now, I understand what it means to live in a town that got its first stoplight when I was almost 20. I also understand what it means to literally have a butcher who he was through my great grandmother, grandmother, mother, and then retired around my time in high school. We understand those contexts. Who do you have at the table? And I think Rafi does a great job with this. I know Meryl does, Courtney, all the folks that you see here today does a great job. But envisioning systems mean looking at policy demands differently looking at the intersection of what policies are created to allow systemic impact on land loss that isn't directly labeled land right in the policy number two is having diverse constituents around the table paying them for their time and making sure that the practices that are centered there is made by the people who have to live and endure those practices those policy points and then third is not being afraid to say that our constitution, be it North Carolina or US, is garbage. Oh, I said that. That is really, that's really blunt, y'all. <laughs> it's garbage. Okay. The fact that it can be gerrymandered and we can't change that because it's in the North Carolina Constitution. And those gerrymanders perfectly match all of the environmental dirty corporations in the black belt of North Carolina. That's not happenstance. When you have over half of historically black colleges and universities in North Carolina was packed in a single congressional district, and that same district has coal ash, you diluted the youth's power, which goes to your second question. How do you get the youth involved? Stop the folks who are impacting and impeding their civic desire to elevate their constitutional right. And that even goes to gerrymandering. We completely halted an entire, as a state, when I say we, no fault of ours here, but the state literally impeded students of color from being able to vote how they wanted to vote for their own communities, even down to A&T University where their campus was split in half. And when students and youth see that, how can we be connected to land when the land can literally be politically divided between our very legs when we stand in the middle of the street? That's your land. So it's so many layers that for youth and, and, and we say young people, I was active, I'm still young, great, but you know, I've been in the game for about like 17 years, even though some people look at me. And when I say youth, we don't like disingenuous. The youth are completely different. They're a different breed, y'all. They were protesting all pandemic. Pan yeah. A pandemic didn't scare them. Pan they were, it was a global march. It's different. And so they're already involved. They're just looking at how are we dismantling these policies? What legacy are you leaving? And then they're leaving us if we are not getting with them. They're done and they're already engaged. And people who see that engagement will then become more enthralled by that engagement because they see that their fellow peers have been responded to. And so those are just some elements, but it's a lot of intersection. And I hope they answered some question and, you know, spur some thought. No, no, I think you did. I mean, it's powerful. I, mean, I, I love the, the the saying, talking about partnership, um, amplifying voices as directed, you know, and not just amplifying voices for um, just to just to amplify them and say that you did. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, we did want to share some resources, and I had like a, little, a few resources I want to share as we talk a little bit about being connected to, to, to voting resources and information. I'm going to share those super quickly and then give each one of our panelists um, an opportunity to share resources that they know of or um, just the last couple of uh, parting shots they want to leave us with before market closes out. So um, did is that slide ready or can I just share mine or? Either way, I can share, you can share. Okay, if you, if you don't mind sharing, I'll, I'll do mine really, I'll do it super quickly. One moment. Sure. 
just a couple things, folks, and I won't take too long in this. So uh, I think you've heard and, um, Pastor Blow talked a little bit about having partnerships with democracy and seeing their other uh, places that are supporting voter education. Um, but one of the things that um, that's been super helpful um, to get information is Democracy NC. Um, they have been working with, I think, about 45 or 46 other nonprofits and different organizations to do voter education, to get people out to, um, to be knowledgeable at Board of Education meetings and give some folks some strategy. They're doing online pledges. Um, they uh, provided um, some information at a, a website called ncvoter.org that has a whole bunch of stuff on there that kind of gives you um, uh, answers to questions that you may not know, stuff that's, um, some stuff that's common sense, some things that you hadn't thought about. Um, and of course, State Board of Elections has some information there. Um, a lot of folks that are doing voter registration are going through um, the DOT, through, through the DMV. So those are uh, a few things that we found to be pretty helpful. Um, and then the next thing really quick, and, I'm sh and I think Margaret and team will provide something that, that's out there um, that you guys can have a full list of, of the resources that are being shared. So Lamisha is sitting sharing some stuff too. One of the things that Democracy, Democracy NC is doing through these communities is encouraging folks to either by paper or through online pledge is to just create a plan. Uh, you create a plan, just basically says whether you're registered, what you need to do, um, and you're sending that information to them. They are compiling th those contacts and reaching out to people uh, to make sure that they have everything that they need and remind them of their early voting for their counties and stuff like that. Um, so you make a plan, make a pledge. Those are available um, through community. And then in that last slide. Uh, and then also, if you just want to help somebody find out if they are registered to vote through the, um, through the State Board of Elections, there's a voter search that's pretty easy to use. It allows you to just to research and make sure that you are registered to vote. So those are just some simple things that we're going to share. And what I'll do now is we will go back to our panelists. And if there's other resources, I see Lamisha shared a few things. Um, if each one of our panelists want to share some resources, um, please do so. And if there's any other things that you'd like to leave our folks with um, before Margaret closes us out, um, we've, we've got about five, six minutes, we can do that. Mm -hmm. I can keep it real brief. That website, Safe Voter NC, is a program that North Carolina Black Alliances uh, has launched um, along with our partners at Disability Rights North Carolina and Equality North Carolina. And so if you visit this website, there's information and resources. Um, but what is really, really critical is, um, and I really want to elevate, you can request a free voter safety kit. Uh, if you do choose to exercise your vote in person. And so that kit uh, consists of PPE, um, gloves, hand sanitizer, and a disposable pen for your time at the at the polls. And so we do use, I also want to clarify, we do use a third party vendor who completely handles the sanitization of all that. So that is put together and, and will be shipped to folks. Um, and we are doing that now, but please visit that website and just, yeah, and please share it with community as well. We're trying to spread the word. Thank you. Okay, uh, just briefly, first of all, that site that Meryl just sh shared with you where you can look up your voter status, you can also print off of that site a, a sample of your ballot that you will use to vote in um, November, uh, hopefully between October 15th and October 31st. Those are the early voting dates for North Carolina. In addition to that, you can turn in your absentee ballots at any one-stop location. You, you, you can turn in your absentee ballot. It just has to be either the voter themselves or a close family relative that turns it in. Not anybody could just turn it in for you. So that, that's uh, one piece as well. Uh, the other thing is, is uh, I did mention earlier that we have voter guides as of to, tomorrow. I'm supposed to be getting, I don't know, 10, 12,000 of them and they'll be all over the state. Uh, uh, one source is Democracy NC. And those are one of the things that, you know, folk can look at and make the intelligent decisions with regard to voting. Uh, the other thing is I just encourage everybody, everybody to get into this process. Uh, I know that probably everybody on this Zoom today is registered and they, they're, they're going, they plan to vote and they're going to vote early and, and everything. But 
you know, if you can call people and have them call more people and, and, and just uh, don't have to tell them how to vote, just tell them to vote. And then we can provide uh, materials for them uh, to help make intelligent decisions about voting. And uh, so that's pretty much it. I thank you again for being here today. Thank you, Courtney. Pastor Blue? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to just kind of say, um, make sure that as we are doing this work in terms of um, get out to vote, that we, we studied the ballot so we can ask, uh, answer people's questions that they may have, like who's on the ballot, and, and just tell them it's gonna take a little time. Uh, the ballot is full. And um, also, um, uh, the other thing I would encourage people to do is to build a relationship uh, with your local board of elections, the people that work in the office and the members that are on the board. So you will know somebody that if you have a concern um, as we move forward, you have a direct contact and a name. And I think that that work is helpful. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you, vote your power. Um, any other things? We have, we have about a minute or so. If there's any, uh, there's something that you, that any of our speakers want to leave our folks with, um, you got an opportunity. To, uh, take about thirty seconds. If there's any other additional stuff. This has been really edifying for me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you guys tonight and um, here. Um, to just, you know, there's some information that you think you know and you don't have full context and it's super helpful to kind of get some details. And I, I'm looking forward to to further conversations down the road with uh, Lamisha and Courtney and Pastor Blow. Um, there's so much information that we got today that just, that I, that I would love to know a little bit more. And I'm sure a lot of you feel the same way. Um, so if there's no other parting shots from our speakers, I will hand the, uh, the mic over to Margaret and close us out. Um, this has just been a, a wonderful evening. Uh, two hours has went by just like that. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for moderating, Merrill. Uh, and it has been a pleasure to work with you. Um, and I feel also so grateful and lucky to have met and gotten to work with um, Courtney and Lamicia and Pastor Blow. So, um, Thank you for the work that you are already doing and for taking your time to do this. Um, a couple things I wanna highlight before we leave. Um, what Pastor Blow was just saying about knowing who is on your ballot. Um, so true, there's so many state and local elections happening that really impact the well-being of farmers, of workers and North Carolinians in general. Um, and Rafi recently hosted a candidate forum um, for several of those state level races. Um, we will include that recording in the resource list we send out, but I learned a ton about the candidates and um, including candidates for um, ag commissioner and labor commissioner among others. Um, and I think it's really worth checking out that form if you haven't. Um, I want to tell you about a couple things that are coming up on um, Rafi's calendar. Um, the Farmer of Color Network uh, that I mentioned at the beginning of the call uh, will be having a series of webinars um, targeted um, for farmers of color on issues like farm legacy and estate planning, cooperative development and food movements, social media, online marketing, land access. Um, we will send you those dates. Um, if that's you or if there are people in your life you know who might benefit from those webinars, um, Please, please help spread the word. We are also continuing this community conversation series, um, which is through the Come to the Table program. Um, we're gonna keep adding events. These are, we're learning too much, meeting too many people to stop doing them. Um, <laughs> the next two are really um, for pastors. Um, there is going to be one on September 30th about fiscal trauma specifically for clergy. Um, and one that is sort of like a wellness check-in for pastors on October 9th. So we'll send you all that information. Hope you can come or tell the people in your life about it. Um, and the very last thing, as always, is that we would love for you to fill out <laughs> a very quick survey and evaluation of this event. I'm putting the uh, link in the chat. Um, 
both about this event and your ideas for future events. We would re we really, really appreciate hearing from you on those. Um, so, and I think it'll take you less than two or three minutes. Um, so thanks for filling it out. Um, I think that's all I've got just beyond an overwhelming sense of gratitude for um, meeting y'all and being in this work with y'all. Um, and, you know, let's work as hard as we can between now and election day to make sure that uh, everyone has access to the ballot and that everyone gets to have a say in uh, our government. So thanks very much. Thank you so much for your time.